fix this up quickly. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to be talking a bit about this kind of project that I've been involved with um, going back to 2012 or so uh, on what was known as the foreign fighter phenomenon. Um, and and, and uh, it basically involved um, interviewing foreign fighters while they were fighting, uh, talking to parents and family members while they were, while they, while their kids went overseas to fight uh, with kind of listed terrorist entities at the time. Um, and what was different about this, this period was, um, you know, we've had, we've had foreign fighter phenomenon in the past, of course, but this time uh, it was kind of a younger generation. They were social media savvy. They had Instagram accounts, Tumblr accounts, uh, Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts. Um, and once they landed in the war zones of Syria and Iraq, they kind of kept these social media profiles going, right? And so uh, they were tweeting about their breakfasts and they were tweeting about everything uh, that they were up to on the front lines. Um, and it became possible uh, to reach out and talk to them, um, uh, unlike in the past where uh, they were much more difficult to get a hold of. Um, then we went through a nine month ethics process with the University of Waterloo, which um, as you can imagine, I want to talk to terrorists, uh, didn't go over very well with the ethics department. They asked a lot of questions, went back and forth, the lawyers got involved, uh, things got uh, very complicated, but eventually they approved the project and um, off we went. Um, the project, oops, uh, the project uh, involved, as I mentioned, interviewing foreign fighters uh, while they were over there. Uh, as you can see from the right, sometimes they weren't very nice to me, um, but um, it involved interviewing fighters as they were over there, interviewing family and friends of foreign fighters. Um, then I traveled uh, to quite a few places in the Middle East talking to um, returnees, uh, people who had gone off to fight and returned, um, some of the family members in the Middle East as well, to try to get a comparative sense of uh, what, why Westerners were leaving versus uh, why, pe why, uh, why people in the Middle East were leaving, etc. Um, it also involved a quite extensive social media uh, component um, because the online component was very important. And we can, I'm not going to talk about that today, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, I've done quite a bit of work on kind of online communities and um, stuff like that as well. And so I'm just going to be talking a bit about what happened in Canada um, and, and some of the ongoing challenges that we're, that we're seeing uh, with the foreign fighter situation. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, as I mentioned, obviously the foreign uh, issue of foreign fighting is much older. We had people leave uh, in very small numbers to places like Afghanistan, Somalia, Bosnia, Chechnya, um, even Iraq, uh, Libya, etc. over the last three decades or so. Uh, but Syria, the Syrian conflict, which started in May 2011, the Syrian revolution, which started in May 2011, um, was a fundamental game changer, right, when it came to foreign fighters uh, and, and how attractive it was um, for fighters from all over the world. So in, not only in terms of the numbers of people we're talking about, but the diversity of countries that they came from, um, it was unlike anything we'd ever seen before uh, in terms of the sheer mobilization of uh, fighters from around the world traveling to one, uh, traveling to contribute to one conflict. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about uh, what happened there uh, in a second. Uh, this is kind of the outline of the presentation. We'll talk a bit about push factors, uh, talk a bit about women uh, and why they left, because that was a, quite a unique moment as well uh, when it came to ISIS in particular, um, and then the end of the war and then the challenges ahead. <clears throat> so um, in terms of the broader literature, the kind of study of radicalization and the pathways of radicalization, um, that in itself has taken a bit of a turn over the last little while. Uh, one of the main changes has been uh, we've moved from looking at profiles of individuals who are radicalized to kind of looking at their pathways into radicalization, if that makes sense. Um, we often in the past used to talk about what kind of person was vulnerable to radicalization or who was vulnerable to recruitment. Um, we don't necessarily talk in that language anymore. Um, this is we, we one thing that was clear was that they individuals traveled this pathway in remarkably different ways. Uh, they came from um, different, entirely different backgrounds, and uh, the process by which they joined uh, became much more interesting and much more important to understand, as opposed to whether there was something about them uh, that was enlightening along those lines. Um, 
The second thing is uh, we moved away from looking at radicalization to violence as a kind of psychopathology uh, instead of asking, you know, what is wrong with them? I think terrorism studies was a bit slow to make this discovery, but I think um, it's been it's been quite well known in criminology and other fields for a long time that um, a lot of these individuals are, in the words of the NYPD, uh, remarkably ordinary, right? They're very ordinary young men um, who join uh, join these kinds of movements. Uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with them from a psychopathological point of view. Um, the third one uh, was to look more at the heterogeneity problem. Uh, no one radicalizes in the same way. They come from uh, a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, converts, not converts, um, <clears throat> and so on. And, and this has just become more complicated now that we look more deeply at the far right problem uh, domestically as well, and that um, not nobody comes to this movement, nobody comes to join these movements in any particular way, which is interesting academically, but it's also very frustrating from a policy perspective because you still get these questions from government like, um, what can we do to stop this, right? And, and uh, they want kind of a one clear answer often, and it's not often uh, easy to provide something like that. Um, Fourth uh, is the specificity problem. Um, there was a, th there's still a tendency, particularly in the media sometimes to kind of point to one thing as uh, the actual cause of this radicalization. So you might hear things like, oh, it, you know, they were all poor or they all had some sort of political grievance or they're all uneducated or high school dropouts. Um, turns out none of that is true. <laughs> um, they all come from uh, again, a variety of backgrounds, rich, poor, um, and, and the causal mechanism um, is also very difficult to pinpoint, right? So just because you're poor doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become a terrorist. There's a, lots of people who are poor who don't become terrorists. There's lots of high school dropouts who don't become terrorists. And, and therefore, uh, this kind of causal relationship that was very simplistically drawn in the past between uh, a particular character trait or a particular uh, situation uh, and you joining and uh, joining some sort of movement um, it, it is kind of long gone at this point. Um, the fifth one um, is is the data problem, and this is an ongoing problem, I would say, uh, in terrorism studies for obvious reasons. Most of these groups are clandestine. Most of these groups are secretive, um, and so you can't necessarily go out and talk to them in the same way. Um, that you would with any other kind of research project where you can just kind of, you know, uh, do interviews or do surveys and uh, try to find out uh, different things about individuals. Uh, there's a kind of ongoing uh, data problem when it comes to this kind of, when it comes to this topic in particular. Um, the specificity problem um, is probably the one that looms the largest. Um, we simply, even after decades of research, don't really know why this last jump occurs, right? So there's the general population. Within the general population, there are people with some sort of grievance. Uh, they generally either go into pro-social behaviors like volunteering or doing some sort of civic engagement. Uh, within that population, there might be some who are radicalized. Um, you know, may, they may say radical things, uh, but they're not necessarily radicalized to violence. Um, and then there are some who, uh, very tiny minority usually, who engage in some sort of violence. And um, it's not entirely clear who those people might be or why that jump uh, actually occurs. Some people um, jump from the general population to violence, right? They don't, and then you talk to them later and realize they're not particularly radical in their thinking or particularly have any particular grievance, but they they found something in violence um, that, that, that addressed whatever, uh, concern they had at the moment. And so um, this, this kind of upside down pyramid um, continues to be a challenge for uh, radicalization and terrorism studies. So that's kind of the theoretical background or the, or the kind of research background uh, that we are that we often work with. Um, in terms of the foreign fighter phenomenon, I'm going to focus just on Syria because um, it'll probably keep us busy enough. Uh, in Canada, uh, what did we see? Um, starting, so as I mentioned, the Syrian revolution begins in May 2011, uh, and quite immediately you saw um, a bit of a movement in, in uh, kind of among some young Muslims in Canada who wanted to go do something, right? There was something about Syria <coughs> um, which was particularly, particularly galvanizing from the very beginning. Uh, and starting in 2012 or so, um, 
as the opposition became more militant, uh, opposition against the Assad regime in Syria became more militant as human rights violations from the Assad regime grew. Um, there were some, there were kind of two waves of people who left from Canada. And I think this is true for some other countries, but not necessarily um, all countries. And there's no, there's also no kind of neat differentiation between number one and two. There's uh, some who uh, went, uh, went in the first wave and actually joined the Islamic State later, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so the, the transnational activism component, um, they're, they're kind of the first wave of people who left, I would say, late 2012 onwards. Um, and they were, they were focused particularly on getting rid of the Assad regime, uh, sometimes installing an Islamic state in Syria. Um, but they weren't, uh, they were looking at kind of very localized nationalist, in many ways, revolutions, getting rid of the dictator. Um, and setting up a new kind of society. And that's all they were really concerned about. Um, if it actually happened, they would have probably come back home and moved on with their lives, right? And so this is what we saw in the past, for example, in uh, places like Afghanistan, Chechnya, Bosnia. Uh, the second wave of fighters um, left sometime around 2013, late 2013, and it really picked up after the Islamic State declared uh, its so-called caliphate uh, or the Islamic State in June 2014, uh, which is, was their attempt to kind of establish a kingdom of God on earth, um, a kind of uh, religious theocracy um, governed according to religious principles. Um, and this was in many ways, the declaration of the caliphate uh, was, uh, was also a, an important game changer because uh, for a lot of people that I talked to in Canada, for example, um, they basically, like even people who weren't radicalized, they said, if this is an actual caliphate, if this was a legitimate caliphate, I'll be on the next plane out of here, right? And so the very use of the term caliphate, the very kind of establishment of an Islamic state um, created ripples around, uh, around the Muslim community in many, in many countries. Um, and the people who left during this period um, <clears throat> were, I would say, uh, fundamentally different from the first wave. They were uh, tended to be much more religiously Puritan, um, ideologically Puritan. They were, they were not thinking about replacing Assad in a particular country and then returning home. They were saying things like, we're going to plant the flag of Islam on the White House lawn. We're going to establish a global caliphate, uh, take over the world, etc." cetera. <clears throat> Um, so what did it look like across, um, it's not clicking, one second, okay. Um, so what did it look like across Canada uh, from, from, I'll just kind of go from west to east. Um, in British Columbia, you had uh, several people leave at the time, particularly in 2013. Uh, at the top there, you have Hazibullah Yousafzai, um, who by all accounts, you know, was into working out and posting topless photos of himself on Facebook, uh, and then all of a sudden became uh, radicalized and traveled to Syria. Um, nobody's really heard from him since. We don't know what happened to him. Uh, another person under him there is Kimberly Pullman, who is our oldest foreign traveler. Um, she was, I think, 40, in her late 40s when she left. Um, she is currently in prison uh, in a Syrian detention camp in, in northeast Syria, waiting to be repatriated back to Canada. Um, um Suleiman here is another young woman who's currently in prison in north, northern Syria, uh, is also married to another Canadian fighter. Um, so British Columbia is pretty, was pretty thin for the most part in terms of travelers. Uh, Alberta, there was quite a few. Uh, the five that you see at the bottom were the first travelers, I would say, that that's really splashed on the media. Um, so Farah Sheridan on the left there, um, he made that famous video that many of you may have seen, um, who uh, burned his passport, uh, gave an interview with Vice News, etc., uh, about how, you know, we are coming for you, Obama, we're going to plant the flag of Islam on the White House lawn, and so on. Um, the guy in the middle there and the one beside him uh, are quite interesting because they were all good friends, um, but they, again, to talk about the heterogeneity problem, um, they're fundamentally different, right? And so Damien Claremont is a white convert, high school dropout, uh, suffered from several different mental illnesses, um, uh, had kind of uh, issues growing up. Uh, the person beside him, uh, Salman Ashrafi, he's born Muslim, uh, 
uh, university educated, had a $100,000 paying job at Talisman Energy in Alberta, um, had a wife and a child at the time that he left. And so uh, very different backgrounds, but very close friends. Um, both traveled in late 2012 and both were uh, killed uh, or died in, in, in uh, mid-2013. Um, at the top, there's, there's several, several people from uh, Edmonton, uh, surprisingly very large numbers from Edmonton. Um, I spent a lot of time with uh, Hamza or Mahad Hersi's father, um, who talked about his family coming, uh, moving as refugees from Somalia, living for a time in Italy, um, coming to Edmonton. Um, basically, his wife uh, descended into alcoholism and prostitution. His other son got diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, and so he sends his only, uh, his quote unquote, good son to live with his cousins, Hamza and Hersi. Uh, they all leave uh, Canada to go fight in Syria uh, and are all killed in 2015 in the famous kind of uh, battle for Kobani, uh, where uh, a whole host of foreign fighters were killed uh, because ISIS decided that uh, Kobani was worth saving. Um, and so they just kind of sh kept shipping foreign fighters uh, particularly Westerners, Brits, and Canadians uh, to the front lines, uh, and they all, um, by estimates, there's like 40 or 50 who were killed uh, just in that one battle alone. So quite a heartbreaking story out of um, for Ma Mahat's father, um, in terms of you know having lost uh, having lost his son. Um, nobody from Saskatchewan, <laughs> surprisingly, um, I guess. Uh, not many from Manitoba either. Ontario is, again, very large number. Um, the guy on the left there uh, is Abu Ridwan, um, who's been in the media quite often uh, lately um, because he is the English language voice behind almost every single ISIS release since 2015. Uh, so if, you, if you've ever heard an English language ISIS video, uh, whether it's Flames of War or Flames of War II or the um, uh, claim that they put out after the Paris attacks in November 2015, um, that was all his voice, right? He was the one narrating uh, and talking about all of them. Um, the guy right under him is Tamim Chowdhury. Uh, he is not from Syria, but he somehow traveled from uh, from Canada, I think Calgary, uh, and potentially Windsor, um, to Bangladesh, where he masterminded the Dhaka artisan uh, bakery attack in 2016, if you guys remember, uh, where 22 people were hacked to death uh, in this kind of bakery uh, that was uh, frequented by Western uh, foreign travelers. Um, I, I tried to find him for a long time and I wrote this little thing that you guys can um, look up if you like um, about trying to dig, dig out his identity. <clears throat> but um, turns out he's Canadian and um, he was the kind of leader of ISIS in Bangladesh for a time. Um, the guy with the towel over his head is Ahmed Wasim. Uh, me and him used to talk almost daily. Um, he's uh, quite an interesting story from Windsor, Ontario, um, traveled to Syria, um, joined a variety of different militant groups, uh, eventually was shot in the leg and through the groin, uh, manages, manages to make it back to Canada, uh, spends a year in Windsor recuperating. Um, the RCMP gets wind of him and basically starts interviewing everybody he knows, all of his family members, everyone close to him. Um, he manages to leave again a second time, uh, landing in Syria, calls his RCMP handler from Syria and says, uh, you, uh, I, you know, I'm back in Syria, please leave my family alone, right? Uh, a year later, he joins the Islamic State, uh, and two months later, he's killed um, fighting, fighting for ISIS. Um, and so, you know, on and on it goes, there's different stories uh, that we could talk about. Um, in terms of who these individuals are, um, but they all, as I mentioned, have a kind of very particular individual background um, and um, are all kind of influential in, in different ways. Um, Quebec, also um, large numbers. The interesting thing about Quebec is the large number of women who left from here. Um, that was another, as I mentioned earlier, kind of particularly unique aspect of the Islamic State um, in that Al-Qaeda, for example, never asked for women, right? They never asked for uh, female fighters or females to come travel overseas and join their group. Whereas ISIS, because it was pitching itself as the kingdom of God on earth, a kind of state structure, a governance apparatus, um, they very much wanted, they very much had an open door policy, right? If you were a woman 
who wanted to come and have children here, you know, live, live that kind of life, that was fine. Um, uh, they, Al Qaeda was also much more uh, discriminatory in terms of who they led into the organization. You had to have some sort of training, some sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of intelligence about um, how you operated and, and things like that. Whereas ISIS was very much uh, whoever wanted to join could join, right? And so there was a kind of popularity, um, popularity aspect to ISIS as well during this period. Um, so a lot of people left from Quebec. Um, a lot of people were stopped at the airport in Quebec and sent back home as well. Um, and so, uh, again, large numbers, not many from Atlantic Canada, uh, but very large numbers from Alberta and Ontario and Quebec um, in terms of who went. And I'll talk about kind of where they are at the, uh, in a second. Um, did women leave for different reasons? Um, I think there was a lot of talk in the beginning, you know, words like jihadi bride were thrown around. Um, that women were tricked and taken into Syria was, was uh, thrown around. There was a general assumption uh, in the media, at least, that women were joining the Islamic State because they were tricked by the men or they fell in love with men uh, and, and things like that. And, there, and that was treated as the majority of the cases um, in terms of what happened. Um, <clears throat> and I think there was de there's definitely some instances of those happening, but uh, for the most part, um, that for the most part, the women left for the same reason that the men did, right? And, and so because they wanted to live uh, in an Islamic state, they wanted to um, participate in this kind of important historical moment where the kingdom of God on earth was being established and they wanted to be on the front lines of that campaign um, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, this is an email I received from a friend uh, of a woman who'd left from Quebec. Um, and she was asked um, after after their after their friend left, they a bunch of women from Quebec were basically emailing her nonstop. Uh, you know, where did you go? We haven't heard from you in weeks. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> she responded to them with this kind of long letter about why she left and, and the thinking behind her decision to go. Um, and uh, one of the things that struck me is this quote about I felt dirty and deadly being living in Canada. Right. And, and what she meant by that uh, is that she felt dirty in the sense of kind of cultural pollution. She felt that um, an aspect of herself, her Muslim identity was being eroded um, by living in the West, that something about Western culture was uh, tainting her pure Muslim, uh, her, or her effort to live a pure Muslim life. Um, and she felt dirty because she felt like she was living in a country and paying taxes to a country that was killing her people. Right. That that. Um, that she was um, being be somehow an accomplice or complicit um, in the death of uh, innocent Muslims abroad, um, and that that uh, that wasn't something that she wanted to be a part of. Um, um, the second thing she said was, you know, I had no purpose here, uh, and she's from Quebec, so there was this real kind of um, experience of discrimination, feeling like your clothing and your identity and your Muslim identity. Uh, was very much part of the national conversation, was very much uh, engaged, part of the political conversation in the province. Um, and that as a Muslim woman who wore a headscarf, uh, there was no real upward mobility for her. There was no real uh, place to go. And so that combined with, I think, the establishment of the Islamic State, this idea that you can come here uh, and live a pure Islamic life. Um, we're not at war here. We're a functioning state, et cetera, um, had a real impact on some of these women. Um, who decided to go. So they left for a lot of the same political uh, and religious reasons as the men did, um, even, even if it was kind of pitched as, um, you know, in the beginning at least, that they, they were leaving for love and they fell in love with fighters, etc. There's definitely an element of that, but it, was, it wasn't the majority as was often uh, portrayed. So why did they leave? Feelings of isolation, belief that the Muslim community was being persecuted, um, anger that this, this persecution wasn't really being addressed in any meaningful way, uh, that it is a religious duty to kind of live within a purely Islamic environment, um, sisterhood, um, to get married. There's definitely uh, some instances of that. Um, and also some instances of uh, being taken, taken there by their husbands, but uh, definitely not the majority of them. Um, so, that's kind of them leaving uh, their life there. Uh, and, then, and then things start to take a turn for the worst, right? Um, starting in March, 2017, 
Um, in Iraq, you have the campaign to retake uh, the so-called administrative capital of the Islamic State, which was in Mosul, the city of Mosul. Um, that gets taken a few months later in July 19th, 2017. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and, and you can see the gray area here is ISIS control in March and basically entirely taken back by the Iraqi forces in uh, a couple months later. Uh, the same thing with Syria. I, the, the, the city of Raqqa was um, the de facto capital of the Islamic State uh, ever since they took it over um, in, in, in 2014. Um, this is their level of control in May 2017 and basically entirely taken back by the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, a couple months later. Um, and, and so I, I was in Raqqa in 2019 and um, it, it, you know, it's a bustling, vibrant city. Uh, definitely uh, fear of sleeper cell activity um, continues. Uh, a lot of broken down buildings um, and, and a lot of rebuilding that's happening. but. Um, there was definitely a kind of ongoing fear in the city that um, ISIS had basically kind of hidden into the civilian, you know, uh, receded into the civilian population and that they could come back at any moment. Um, and that kind of fear continued for, uh, continued for some time. Um, after Mosul and Raqqa were taken and after much of the Syrian cities that they controlled were taken, um, a kind of mass of humanity uh, and fighters was basically um, boxed in uh, in this little city called uh, Bagus al Falkani. Um, and that was the level of ISIS control, uh, you know, from its heyday of controlling um, mass amounts of space in Iraq and Syria to this little spit of land in February 2019. Um, a, a year later, uh, basically, victory was declared and uh, ISIS controlled no more land. Um, what happened next was um, basically, I think there was an underestimation of how many people were actually in this bit of land. Um, I think the Syrian Democratic Forces prepared for a couple thousand, maybe tens of thousands. Um, what came out of that was close to 60, 70,000 people um, who they weren't ready for. Um, and they were all uh, shipped, uh, the men were shipped to different prisons in northeastern Syria, and the women and children uh, were shipped to a, a series of camps, kind of open air IDP camps uh, in northeastern Syria. And that was March 2019, um, and there they still remain, right? So we're, we're heading into the almost three year anniversary um, of this campaign and uh, the vast majority of Canadians, or I should say all the Canadians are still um, still in the camps. Um, this is what some of the early data on the returnee uh, phenomenon looked like. Um, there was a real concern from the very beginning. Uh, I remember being in government meetings as early as 2013, talking about, you know, all these people are traveling to Syria and Iraq. Um, I'm sure they're all going to come back. Right, um, but there was no real discussion about what to do when they come back. Uh, do we have enough uh, kind of de-radicalization programs? Do we have any institutions in place? Do we have any help for the children uh, set up to actually receive them when they return? Um, those kinds of conversations took a while uh, to get going, but this was kind of what the returnee phenomenon looked like uh, in the early days. And um, outside of these numbers, um, they still remain in prison in northeastern Syria, which I'll uh, get into in a second. Um, so the fear in the beginning uh, about the returnee phenomenon kind of looked uh, looked, looked different ways. Um, most of us theorized that uh, the hardcore loyalists were, of course, going to fight to the death, and that's basically what happened uh, in March 2019. Uh, mass amounts of fighters were killed in the last few days. Um, whoever remained would form a kind of ISIS 2.0, and that's basically what's happened. Um, since then, you're, you've seen they don't control any land, but you've seen um, basically a dozen to two dozen sleeper cell suicide attacks every single month for the last two years or so. Um, <clears throat> there was the other fear that um, people who are still alive at the end of this will probably travel to the next theater of jihad. Uh, whether that's Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, et cetera, um, or Somalia as well. There was, a, uh, there was a concern about Somalia at the time. Um, this doesn't seem to have happened. Um, 
as much as we'd feared, uh, and and because I don't think travel out of the country uh, undetected was was really as easy as people thought it was going to be. Um, the returnees also I would break down into kind of three different kinds of people. Um, the ones I've interviewed for the most part fall into the latter two camps, um, but I think there was a real concern that all of them were going to be these operational returnees, right? That uh, people who, people who are trained and dispatched back into Western countries to launch Paris style attacks or Brussels style, style attacks, um, uh, but that 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 wasn't um, the only kinds of returnees we were dealing with. The the second is the what I call the disengaged but not disillusioned uh, returnees who. I would say, you know, for whatever reason, have become anti-ISIS, anti-Al Qaeda, um, sometimes very um, disillusioned with the particular group that they were in or the commander that they worked under. Um, but they're not necessarily disillusioned from the entire movement, right? The entire cause the, that they were a part of. Um, so they might be disengaged from the group. They might be injured. They might be experiencing battle fatigue. Uh, they might have gotten married and had children, um, but they're still kind of supportive of the overall overall cause. Um, <clears throat> so when you ask these people, for example, you know, if there's another mobilization of foreign fighters a couple of years from now, what would you do? Uh, they'll say, I'll be on the next plane out, right? And so uh, for whatever reason, they're disengaged currently, but they're not entirely disillusioned uh, with the broader with the broader cause. Um, then there's the disillusioned category who are very much disillusioned with the broader cause and the movement and the group um, are largely kind of uh, shells of their former person um, and just want to kind of move on with their life um, and uh, forget about everything that they've experienced uh, in the war zone. Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> the foreign fighter concern, um, there was a big concern, of course, that uh, almost a, a very large number of the people that traveled would be returning home. Um, the early studies at least doesn't seem to bear this out. Uh, there are some good studies that were published um, by the RAND network and others that basically estimate that only about 30% of those who left are returning to the countries or, or, or you know, uh, have the potential of returning, uh, returning home. Um, so the vast majority aren't returning. Most of them have died in the fighting. Um, then the question is, well, are they attacking um, when they return? Uh, turns out that's not really true either. Um, of, of some of these studies that looked at uh, jihadist-inspired attacks carried out in the West uh, to see whether any foreign fighters were involved in these attacks, um, only about 18% of perpetrators had traveled anywhere to jihadist-controlled areas. Uh, a second study by Thomas Heckhammer uh, also found about 23%, right? And so um, the vast majority are not returning, and the vast majority are not involved, or I should say, of the jihadist attacks, um, they haven't really been involved in terms of actually participating uh, in, in attack planning. Um, one thing that does seem to be the case, though, is that when they do attack, they tend to kill more people, right? And so of the, of the small number of attacks that they were invo involved in, um, about 35 people to seven uh, 35 people were killed, whereas seven for those who didn't have foreign fighters and foreign fighter involvement, um, uh, which is basically similar to what the Heg Hammer study found as well. And so uh, to, to kind of summarize that, you know, they're statistically less likely to conduct attacks, but when they do, they are far more deadly. So there's kind of an on ongoing concern about, you know, what kind of tactical training did they experience? Do they receive in Syria and Iraq? Um, are they, you know, kind of battle hardened? Are they less, more likely to kill people, more ready to kill people, et cetera, uh, which is a kind of ongoing conversation that's happening in policy circles. Um, so the challenges ahead, as I mentioned, um, with the end of the war in March 2019, uh, the women and children were taken to a variety of camps in the Northeast. One of them, uh, which I visited in 2018 and 2019, uh, was, is known as Al Roj Camp. Uh, there's about 2,300 people in that camp. So keep, keep that number in mind, uh, just, just in terms of comparison, for comparison's sake. Um, there's about 2,376 individuals in that camp. Um, most, the problem, um, most of the camp members are actually refugees from Mosul, which has always been a kind of problem with these camps is that they were opened to house individuals who are running away from ISIS, 
and now they're in the same camp with women and children who were in the last kind of holdouts of ISIS, right? And so they're, they're, so some of these women are pretty hardcore, uh, and now they're um, in the same camp as basically people who were running away from ISIS at the time. Um, several women have been moved to this camp just because it's smaller and a bit safer, uh, because there was kind of endless violence in, in the second camp that I'll talk about. Um, and so this camp itself has been growing a little bit uh, over time. But as you can see from the picture I took, it's just a kind of run-of-the-mill IDP camp for the most part um, that you can find in most, uh, most countries. Um, but there are kind of ongoing issues of child protection, uh, freedom of movement, gender-based violence, um, sanitation, hygiene, uh, food security at this camp as well, even though it's smaller. Um, so this camp is 2,376 people. The second camp is 64,619 people as of uh, last October, which I think was the last count that the UN uh, that the UN took. Um, and so this is the this is the big problem, right? This is the mass uh, this is the massive camp that everyone now talks about. 94% of the inhabitants of this camp are women and children. Um, about 48% are Iraqi and 37% are Syrian. Um, they are mostly in what you see here as phase one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and so there's the Iraqi side and the Syrian side. About 15%, about you know, close to 10,000 of them are foreigners from something like 40 different countries uh, all over the world, uh, whoever hasn't taken back their prisoners. And they are all housed in the annex, right, which is right next to the entrance of the camp. Um, and so this, uh, it's a kind of a very small area where a lot of the foreigners are held and where you see a lot of the violence as well, right? So a lot of the foreigners um, tend to be more radical, tend to be more violent. Uh, there's been stabbings, there's been shootings, um, there's been repurposing of, of NGO kits into weapons. Um, there's been smuggling people in and out. There's been uh, uh, fundraising. There's been all sorts of things that have that have gone on uh, just in the annex. Um, anybody? There's been a few women who are kind of critical of the Islamic State uh, who have been stabbed to death um, and 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 so on. Um, the other thing that you notice about the camp, <coughs> um, particularly when you uh, walk around, is it's basically a sea of children. Um, they're under every tent. They're, they're 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 just everywhere, right? As soon as as soon as I walked in, that was the one thing that was blatantly clear is that they were uh, the whole place was just overrun with children, um, and the, about fifty three percent of them are under the age of twelve, um, and, and and a good chunk, a solid chunk, are under the age of five. <coughs> so um, it's kind of a heartbreaking scene. Um, many of many of these children were born under ISIS control, uh, or and some have even been born in the camps um, after the war ended. And so, um, it's a kind of ongoing ongoing challenge. Um, and Al Hol camp can only be described as a kind of emergency, right? A, a humanitarian emergency. There are about 300 children have died in 2019 alone. There are only three field hospitals for the entire camp, um, acute malnutrition, uh, respiratory diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and much like Roach Camp, um, it also was opened initially uh, for to house refugees. And so you've had a lot of these refugees who are naturally anti-ISIS because they were fleeing from ISIS, now living amongst some of the more hardcore elements uh, who'd come out of the last kind of cities that ISIS held. Um, and naturally there's been um, kind of ongoing violence, uh, ongoing violence as well. Um, one of the things that the guards told me when I was there uh, as well, and, and you, do, you do get um, some of the children who are quite angry at the guards because um, they've been told by their mothers, for example, that uh, the Kurdish guards who are guarding the camp are the ones that killed your father. And so a lot of these Kurdish guards will get rocks thrown at them as soon as they walk in. Um, and so there's a kind of ongoing potential for violence uh, in the camp. Uh, and as I mentioned, people are smuggled in and out. Uh, and a lot of the NGO kits that are going in are being repurposed as weapons um, uh, as well to kind of uh, produce all kinds of different uh, incidents. <clears throat> Um, what has been the impact on children in particular? Um, interrupted education uh, is a major issue. 
Um, most parents, I think most people in the West assume that all these parents who are all hardcore are sending their kids to ISIS schools. Um, turns out that's probably not the case. Most of them just kept their kids at home because they were worried that these schools would get droned or that these children would um, be, you know, get lost or get killed in some form or, no, or some way or another. Um, uh, and so a lot of these children have basically been out of school for five years if they're only, or they've not, never gone to school at all. Um, there is education uh, initiatives being held in the camp by the UN in both Roach Camp and Al Hol Camp, um, but there uh, obviously there's uh, several on ongoing challenges there as well. <clears throat> they've all experienced uh, death of a parent or death of a sibling uh, or parental separation to some extent. Um, they've all been exposed to violence at very young ages, either kind of being in, being in uh, witnessing executions in Syria, experiencing shelling, witnessing drone strikes, um, witnessing beheadings. Um, and so they've all had kind of early exposure to violence. Um, and now uh, they're going through the full on kind of refugee experience as well um, from uh, from Syria to the camps and sometimes from the camps back home. Um, and so there's ongoing issues of um, survivor's guilt and dislocation, uh, learning new languages um, and, and so on. So there's been some initiative, of course, to kind of, um, in Canada at least, there's discussion of uh, what to do with these children when they come back, um, but it, it's still a kind of conversation in its early stages because there's no initiative uh, from the Canadian government to actually bring anybody back yet. <clears throat> um, so the response is uh, the US quite recently uh, brought back everybody, uh, brought back everyone that, they, that was in their custody who was an American citizen. Um, so about 21 adults have returned over the last few years, about 16 of them have been charged. Um, several others are, were minors and so have put, been put into different kind of counseling scenarios, um, some separated from their parents um, and, and, and so on. Um, the U.S. has also canceled uh, citizenships for a few women um, who are still in the camps. Uh, and so the famous one is Hoda Muthanna from Alabama. Uh, she has, I think, one or two children and the U.S. basically canceled her citizenship. Um, and so I think she's still fighting to get that back while in the camp. Um, and so all of these things are kind of ongoing uh, at the time, at the, at the, at the current time. Um, this is what the Canadian situation looks like. Um, about 23 dead, from mostly from Alberta, Ontario, Quebec. This is for, from a total of, of 81 foreign fighters who have left since 2012. Um, my numbers are pretty up to date, it seems like, at least ju judging from the public safety report and the CSIS report, who uh, place the number closer to 90, but uh, these are the ones that I've been able to confirm, uh, about 81 of them. Um, in custody, there's about 21 um, who kind of made it out of the country, but then returned back in some way or another. Um, about six returned and charged, about 10 who were returned and weren't charged or had been placed on peace bonds. Uh, and about 17 who we don't know about. Um, they could, they're likely to have been killed in the final battle, um, but um, I haven't been able to confirm uh, their whereabouts. And so there's, there's quite a few uh, there as well. Um, why hasn't Canada brought anyone back? Um, it's a difficult situation. <laughs> I think part, I think almost entirely, it's a political conversation on, on, from a public policy or public opinion standpoint. Uh, there's a recent, I think this was an Angus Reid poll where they were, where Canadians were asked, you know, would you support bringing back uh, orphaned children? Um, and about 59% said yes. Uh, then the question was flipped to say, would you bring back Canadian women uh, who are currently in Syrian custody? And, and the numbers flipped where they said 66% basically disagreed with bringing them back. Um, and so um, there's kind of ongoing conversation about, uh, you know, bring, repatriation and charging people who were over there, but nothing, no real movement uh, to speak of. Um, there's been some movement on uh, orphans. There was one orphaned girl who was brought back in October 2020 uh, to be reunited with her uncle. Uh, there was a four-year-old uh, brought back in March 2021 um, by, with the help of a U.S. diplomat. Her mother was also then released a, a month or a couple months later. 
Um, she's currently in a in Erbil, Iraq, waiting for the government to provide her some papers to return to Canada, uh, and the government's not providing her the papers, and so she's kind of stranded in Erbil in a hotel, um, being interviewed by Canadian officials, being interviewed by the FBI, um, but hasn't re received permission to actually return to Canada to be reunited with her four-year-old. Um, so these are the three who've kind of made it out of the camps. Um, but the camp, uh, there's still about 15, 14 women and about 25 children who are Canadian uh, who remain in the camp. All of the children are under the age of eight, uh, or I should say the majority of children are under the age of eight. Um, there's about three of them who are, I think, 10 or 11. Um, but that's kind of the situation at the moment uh, with the war coming to an end uh, and the uh, women and children um, still in the camps. So I will leave it there. I'm happy to take your questions.